let's move right into our study in James chapter 4 in the beginning of chapter 5. We've been in a study about the brother of Jesus who wrote a book. We call it the book of James. And the study this week starts with this premise. And the premise is simply this. Selfishness always sabotages. This is a theme of Jesus, and it's certainly a theme of Jesus' brother, James. Self-centeredness, self-focus, self-obsession. Whenever we protect ourselves, seek ourselves, look to ourselves too much, we will always sabotage our own life. Jesus said, anyone who wants to gain their life must lose it, but anyone who seeks to gain their life will lose it. Selfishness is dangerous. And I can illustrate this. I told this story two years ago. I hope you don't mind if I repeat it. It was my mother's birthday this week. My mom passed away five years ago, and I was thinking about her. And this story of my mom, how many here have a great mom? This story of my mom just was the perfect illustration for this moment. My mother had a wonderful antique oak table that she prized a more than any of all of her possessions. And my mom raised seven children. And when you raise seven children, how many moms in the room would agree with me? When you raise seven children, all of your stuff gets torn up and battered and ruined. Can anyone agree with me on this? Children are hard on stuff. This table had burns on it from candles and it had watermarks and it had crayons and Play-Doh in the crevices. And when all of the children had moved out of her house, she looked at my dad and she said, I do not care what this will cost me. I will restore this table back to its original glory. There was a uh, uh, antique restorer in our region about 30 minutes from their house. She met with the man. He said, it's going to cost some money and it's going to take about six months. She said, I don't care. Make all nine chairs, all three leaves, and this entire giant oak old table look perfect and pristine again. He said, I'm on the job. Six months later, he called her and he said, your table turned out beautifully. The leaves turned out beautifully. The chairs turned out beautifully. Would you please come and pick it up? This is going to be, you're going to be amazed and shocked. And my mom was just off the charts happy. On the day of the move, she came to my wife. My dad and I had planned to take his pickup truck on a November morning and pick this table up. And she came to my wife and she said, I don't want to say this to my son, your husband, because I love him. And he's a wonderful kid. And at the time, I was 36. How many know your mom always thinks of you at 13? <laughs> and she said, I just, I just, you and I both know that he's a clumsy, clumsy boy. <laughs> and so would you gently approach him? And could you just ask him as he moves my prized possession? Could you just ask him to please be a little careful? Kelly said, no worries. I've lived with this man. I know that what you say is true. And she came to me in humility and she said, listen, I don't want to offend you, which immediately offended me. <laughs> but your mom has told me, now I'm double offended. <laughs> and we both agree, two warnings, two warnings, but I'm not going to listen to either one because by this time my ego is just raging. She wanted me to tell you if you could please... Be a little careful with their table because we all know sometimes you trip and you, you're prone to acts. And so right there, I just stopped her and I said, I cannot believe this woman still thinks I'm 13 years old. I am the director of Chi Alpha Campus Ministries, Northern California. And I'm the regional rep. I've planted more campus ministries, spoken 40 states. I got a business card. I have a business card that I give people. They printed it and I, I own this thing and I have a title and an email address and stuff graduated from degrees and things. People come to meetings when I call them. <laughs> Your mom doesn't care about any of that, does she? It's a funny thing about the truth, it works. I was having this argument with my mother all morning as I moved this table, but while I actually carried the table, I was the most careful I had ever been. I'm watching every step. I put it in the truck. We cover it in foam. We cover it in blankets. We tie it down. It's perfect. I jump back in my dad's truck. I'm like, see, I'm 35 years old. I got a business car. I'm not a clumsy boy anymore. <laughs> We're starting to pull out from this guy's workshop. And just as we pull away from his loading dock, another truck comes in. And then my dad stops and he goes, oh, we forgot the leaves. The three big leaves that, you know, make the table bigger at holiday seasons. I said, oh, don't worry. I'll run in, get them really quick. You move the truck so the other guy can get in. And so I ran back into the workshop, and sure enough, there they are laying on the ground. And I run up to them, and a little voice tells me, make two trips. 
proving that the sinful nature is alive and well in everyone, I ignore that voice. I pick up all three old heavy oaken leaves and I gently make my way out of the workshop and I start walking on the loading dock down a ramp to where my dad's truck is now. And the last thing I think is, wow, the pavement is two different shades of color. Just then, my foot steps on the darker pavement, which turns out to be black ice. As I hit black ice, I go into full slow motion mode. I don't know if your life has ever been into slow motion. It happens when you're about to do something catastrophic. Most of us that have been in slow motion, the last time it happened, you were in the Target parking lot, you realized you were gonna get into fender bender, you thought to yourself, I have a $500 deductible, I can't afford $500. My wife or husband is gonna be upset with me. What a hypocrite, they had an accident last year, I wasn't upset with them. You can think all of that in a millisecond. A millisecond, people. In that millisecond, I thought, oh no, my mom and my wife are right. I collect embarrassing moments like most people collect stamps. I thought that. <laughs> and my feet flew up over my head and I threw those threw three oaken planks high into the air and I fell back and my head went bam against the cement and I looked up and in full Warner Brothers mode, bam, 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 three planks hit me on the forehead. My dad came rushing to my side. He said, are you all right? I was like, oh. He said, are you okay? Do I need to take you to the hospital? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. He said, are you okay? And I said, I think I'm going to be all right. He said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, it just really hurts, but I'm going to be all right. And he said, good, because that was the funniest thing I have ever seen <laughs> in my life. Three times on the 30-minute drive home, he pulled over and said, it's not safe for me to drive under these conditions. <laughs> He's laughing too hard. I got home. This is interesting. And too directly to the point of our sermon today, I, my dad walks in the house. My mom goes, how's my table? And he said, oh, the table's fine. The leaves need three more months. And she looked at me after my dad told her the story. And she said, are you okay? And I said, yes. And she said, good, because you're, you're, you're more valuable to me than any old table. You see, when our ego begins to direct our strategy, we will always sabotage our lives. When our ego directs our strategy, we will always sabotage our lives. This is exactly the scene in James, the book of James, especially in the end of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five, he's very direct. He's very, very almost harsh in his tone and temperament. Why? Because he's talking to a couple of people that are not listening to him. He's talking, first of all, to self-centered scholars, people that were high up in the Jewish religion and had an encounter with Christ, and yet they're bringing their old experiences and their old ego and their old leadership and pride of position into their Christianity. And even though Christianity is the most selfless philosophy ever invented, these scholars have found a way to argue with each other. He's also talking to self-sufficient skeptics. He's still addressing some in the community that didn't come to Christ. They saw the life of Christ. They saw the death of Christ. They saw the resurrection of Christ. And yet their ego has blinded them to who Jesus really is. So both in these prideful scholars and these skeptics, he's speaking very directly and very clearly. Why? Because they're in a massive conflict. The early church is fighting amongst each other. And James wants wants to get rid of the conflict. By the way, how many would say, one holiday in my life, at least one, maybe two, maybe three, I've had some conflict in my family. Anyone here had conflict? What causes the conflict? The same thing that was causing the conflict in this early Christian congregation causes the conflict at your holiday table. It's two things, battles within. 1,800 years before modern psychology, James nails it. He says it's not about the issue. It's not about the email you sent at work. It's not about what someone said five Christmases ago. It's not about who's your mom's favorite was. It's about our insecurities and our fears and our significance, our lack of significance. It's about the battles in our own heart, the battles within. He said there's another reason that we fight. And every conflict, by the way, this is genius. Go back and listen to the messages. Study chapter four. It's the best chapter on conflict ever written in any literature anywhere. He says this, we do two things. We have conflict because of inner insecurity, the battles within, and because we don't get what we want. Simple unmet want makes us go selfish. 
When we don't get what we want, we double down in a self-perspective, which causes conflict. How do you get out of that feedback loop of focusing on yourself and sabotaging yourself? He says, not only do you not get what you want, you don't ask God, who's the only person who can give it to you, and not only do you not look to the right source, but you actually, when you do ask God, you ask with the wrong motives. It's a descending circle of self-focus and sabotage inner insecurities and unmet wants. It's so prevalent and it grieves the brother of Jesus so much that he goes full angry mom mode. How many here have ever had a mother who's been talking and you weren't listening to her? By the way, how many here are mom you feel like nothing you say in your home gets heard? My mom, she had this, and my mom was a very direct person, but she would do this. She'd be telling us everything to do, and no one's listening to her, and everyone's talking over her. And she would literally walk up to you and grab both ears and make you look into her eyes. Listen to me now, young man. I'm about to tell you a thing or two. Does anyone know that tone of voice? <laughs> this is the exact tone of voice that James is using in this portion of Scripture. Twice, once at the end of chapter 4 and once at the very beginning of chapter 5, he has this exhortation. Now, Listen! He said, Kurt, why are you yelling? Because that's the tone of the passage. He said, listen up. Hey, right here. That's what James is saying. Why? Because he doesn't want to see them self-sabotage. And the exhortations that he's going to give them work if they'll apply it. The same goes for you and I. Are you listening this morning? Can you forget for a minute what you're going to do after this service? how poorly your team's quarterback is going to play because it's going to happen. Just forget, just forget about it. Just lay it down and be right here with the Bible just for a couple seconds. Some of you in here, you've never studied the Bible. I want to tell you right now, can you open yourself up to this? This stuff works if we'll work it. There's two exhortations, 413. He's talking about the assumption of future assuming things about our future. And in 5, 1, he's talking about the accumulation of stuff and junk and garbage. Those two exhortations are so relevant to this moment in this holiday in American culture. Wouldn't you agree? Now, why should you and I pay attention? It's simply, it's simple this. There's only one sin. Somewhere on your notes right there, would you just write this sentence? There's only one sin. There's lust, there's greed, there's pride, there's envy, there's all these things, but they all come out of one sin. You know what that one sin is? Selfness, selfishness. It's an unhealthy self-focus. Who's the most famous person of all history? Jesus Christ. What did he do? He was completely selfless. Great acts, whether in your life, in history, or in Jesus, are always coming out of true selflessness. Self-centeredness, self-indulgence, self-righteousness, and self-sufficiency always result in profound self-sabotage. It's counterintuitive. The more we care about ourselves, the more we ruin our futures. But when we really begin to elevate and say, I'm here to serve and love and sacrifice for others, our life gets so much meaning. I only have two points from the two now listen exhortations of James. And they work directly towards this selfishness problem. The first one has to do with a prima donna photographer. He was a well-known photographer for getting incredible epic shots of natural disasters. He'd put himself in many dangerous situations. One summer, a raging forest fire broke out in one of the national parks. And he hurried there in last minute notice. When he got there on the ground, he realized even though the lighting was perfect, he couldn't actually shoot the fire because the smoke obscured the actual fire. He called his editor and he said, I need a plane to fly me into the heart of this forest fire. The editor said, no, it's too dangerous and it's too expensive. He said, listen, I am this incredibly important photographer and I've been on the cover of this and this magazine. Finally, he bullied the editor and the editor said, okay, we'll spend the money. I'll call the airport and get the plane ready. He jumped in his car. He sped as fast as he could to the airport. When he got there, sure enough, there was a plane on the tarmac ready to go. So he grabbed his keys, turned off his car, literally did didn't even park it right, ran right to the plane, jumped in the cockpit, and he looked at the pilot and said, come on, let's go, we're losing the daylight. The pilot put it into full throttle, they got up in the air, and the photographer said, now go right towards the fire, right there. And he said, why would we want to do that? He said, sir, because I am a famous photographer. This is what I do, I take photographs. And the pilot answered him and said, so you're not the flight instructor. (laughs) 
I'm going to let a few of you get that. Um, that didn't. See, he made assumptions about stuff. And when we make assumptions about stuff, we don't only endanger our future. We endanger the futures of others. Here's the first point that I want you to listen to from Jesus' brother, James. Pride blinds. It really does just obscure everything. It's hard enough to see in this life when you're humble. But when you give over to ego, you're bound to trip and to fall and to injure and to look ridiculous and to hurt others around you. Here's how James says it in verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to do this or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money and start a website with online sales. Oh, wait, I added that. Just want to make sure you're listening. Verse 14, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You really don't. In fact, the Greek construction here actually says, you don't even know what will happen or where you will be is the meaning. You don't even know where your feet will be tomorrow. I'm telling you what, the sooner we all just receive that, you don't have any control of the future at all. The soon as you start holding on to it less tight, the happier and less disappointed with this life you'll become. When I first moved to California, I was looking for a campus to start a campus ministry on. They sent me to the city of Turlock. I had never heard of Turlock before. I thought that was an odd name. And this university there is called Cal State Stanislaus. And when we left that city after looking at it for a day, I looked at my wife and I said very boldly, I boasted, don't worry, babe, we'll never live there. I spent two years in the city of Turlock. <laughs> after two years, they asked me to move to Stockton, California to be the Northern California director of our program. I told my wife and every other human that would listen to me, don't worry, I will never live in Stockton, California. I spent eight years in Stockton, California. At one point, they asked me to go on the national staff with live in a place you've never heard of. It's a place without an ocean. It's called Missouri. It's very strange. People live in states without oceans. It's really weird and hard to understand. They asked me to go live in one of these places, and I told everyone, I'll never live in a place like Missouri. I spent six and a half years in Missouri. My current prayer is, Lord, I refuse to go to Hawaii. I will not do it. It's not going to happen. I am standing in opposition to you, Lord. Somehow, my obstinate boasting is not working the same this time. <laughs> Look what he says here. This is so cool. Just, just receive this, would you? He says, what is your life? Wouldn't that be cool in the hustle and bustle of our lives that we actually took a moment to prayerfully answer that question? What is your life? You're built for so much more than most of us end up doing with our lives. What is your life? And you don't got much time to do it. Look at this. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Your future is unpredictable. And do you know something about time? Just receive this. It's unstoppable. You can't stop it. It's a mist. Let me, let me ask you this question. Do you ever get to a point? How many parents we got in the room? How many, how many own a children of you to own a children? You got the registration for children? Okay. <laughs> You ever get to a place where they're just like as cute as a button, they like three or six, and they're just right in that stage, and you're like, stop growing! And then they keep growing and ruin it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wonder if we could all just receive it this Christmas, that it's unstoppable. Time moves. And here's the last thing. This is really kind of important. He says, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will. How would it change people's perceptions of Christ followers if we actually humbly asked that question before every decision? Lord, what's really your will here? We will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Anyone here met that eighth grader who's got every single thing in our world figured out? You met that overconfident eighth grader? So you know, to you and I, to, to, you, to God, you and I sound like an eighth grader when we boast about our future. And here's the last sentence. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. In other words, not only is our future unpredictable and time unstoppable, you and I are accountable. 
There's something God has for you to do. You know, God's wrapping presents, putting up Christmas trees, uh, Christmas lights, all that stuff's important. I'm not saying enjoy the holidays. Don't take yourself so seriously. But in the heart of all that activity, what is your life? You have meaning and purpose. Every cell that's been put together in you is authored by the greatest artist of all time. What is your life? And are you using it for what he has you to do? Because if you're not, it's sin. I had a very difficult decision one year. I had three different choices and they all seemed good. Anyone been in that situation? There was a lot of variables to it and I was very confused and at one point, a close friend who knew all the circumstances around everything, she simply asked me this question, and it's my application question for you right now. She said, Kurt, which one of these decisions will make you closer to the person of Jesus Christ? Somehow that simple desire to follow a simple, humble Lord cut through all the confusion, and I made the decision. And it was a decision I ended up not regretting. It's the same thing I ask you today. What will make you closer to Jesus? It's not that God doesn't want you to plan or be prepared. He wants you to do those things. But we love Jesus, not plans. We plan and then we say, God, you prioritize, not my plans. The second point <clears throat> is about what we get attached to, even unintentionally. I have a friend. How many here have moved a grandparent or parent out of their place and into your home. Anyone had that experience? I had a friend who was moving his wife's grandfather, his kid's great-grandfather, into his home. And on the day they were moving, they went to clean out his garage, and it was stuffed with nine decades full of junk and stuff and garbage. You can accumulate a lot in American life, can't you? How many here have a garage currently that is a testimony to the chaos theory of this life? They filled this entire garage in the largest U-Haul that you are allowed to rent. When they got done, they brought great-grandpa out, and they said, here we go, great-grandpa, it's all loaded up. And he looked at the garage, he said, what about all this stuff? And they said, great-grandpa, that's your garbage. He said, no, it's not. Those are my precious possessions. It was a broken table, broken ladder, broken pieces of junk and stuff and things that didn't work. And he began to cry. How many know that great-grandpa won that argument? They went to the U-Haul and they got a trailer to hook on to the extra long U-Haul truck. So now you have a truck and a trailer. They stuffed it full of garbage and they headed out over the causeways that connect Mississippi and Louisiana. They're driving over these causeways and my buddy Eric actually starts to have a panic attack. Severe winds start blowing them to push them actually literally into the swamp. The truck starts going like this and he's like, oh no, I am going to die for garbage. My life is coming to the end for great grandpa's garbage. Right when it seemed like it was the worst, he heard a mighty snap and all of a sudden the truck righted itself and started driving correctly. He was like, we're saved. Then he looked to his left and saw the trailer that he had just been towing pass him on the causeway. <laughs> it began to turn sideways. He slammed on his brake and almost caused a 50 car pile up. Here's the thing. This is a metaphor for our lives, friends. I wanna tell you, if you are over the age 50, Start giving it away. Yeah. 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 Or can I speak for your grandkids and kids? Or burn it. <laughs> okay, how much permission do I have to speak honestly to these people that I so love in my congregation? Can I say this to you? Your children's art from third grade, not as good as you think it is. <laughs> Mom, you can keep one or two of those onesies. We don't need 17 box of moldy clothes. Friends, what is dragging you and attached to you and glued to you that Christ does not want to be attached or dragged or glued to you? Listen, greed binds. That's the second point of this passage today where James wants us to listen closely. Pride blinds us and greed binds us. It glues us to stuff and junk and things. Look what he says here in verse one of chapter five. Now listen, you rich people. By the way, everyone in this room is rich. If you make 14K a year, you're in the top 10% of everyone on this globe in absolute wealth. If you have access to a car, you're one of the richest people that's ever lived on the globe. If you make 25K, you're in the top 2%. You're a 2%er if you make 25K. 
If you make 150K combined income in your household, you're in 0.05 percentage of all wealth right now. That's not counting for all history. In relative to all history, if you live in Roseville, Loomis, Rockland, Folsom, if you live in our area, if you live in our state, if you live in our country, you are very, very wealthy relative to human history. Now listen, all of us at Bayside Church. Weep and well because of the misery that is coming on you. You see, with the mishandling of wealth, there is always severe misery. We're actually going to study this a little bit more, and we're going to get very positive and very practical on how to countermine this in the next couple weeks. Verse 2, your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. We are literally getting bound to rotting things. We're getting attached to things that have been moth-eaten. Here's my application question. Do I own things that in reality own me? Do I own things that own me? How do we overcome this? Here's my final thought, and I'm going to move quickly here. Joy overcomes. He writes this at the beginning. Let's remember the whole theme of the book. Consider it pure joy. Meditate on it. Consider it. Look at it. He wants us in the midst of trials and even opposition to put our focus not on self, but the joy of the Lord. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's a matter of what you're looking at. Let me ask this question. How many here have ever seen this code, A113? Have you seen this? A113. No, here's the truth. Every single one of you has seen it. Let me ask it this way. How many here have seen a Pixar movie? If you've seen a Pixar movie, raise your hand. I know that's the end of the... Okay, good. Awesome. You've seen A113 because it's in every single Pixar movie. It's in the Toy Story. It's the mom's license plate. It's in Monsters U on a door. It's in Up in a courtroom. It's in Finding Nemo on a camera. It's in Ratatouille on a tag on a rat's ear and on and on and on. It's in many, many Disney movies in the last five or six years. It's in a lot of life. It's in the Hunger Games right now. You can look. By the way, now that I've told you about it, you won't be able to watch any of these movies without looking for it. (laughs) You know what it is? It's simply a student from Cal Arts the most famous animation school. And on a project, he said, I want to put a code that other CalArts students would understand. This is the door to the first-year graphic design classroom at CalArts. It's room A113. And he put it on something, and other CalArts grads saw it, and they said, we're going to put it in our projects. Now it's a hidden sign that says, a CalArts grad was here doing great work. Here's my question to you. Can you see what Jesus has done in our world? Because he's the same. In little ways and big ways, he's left little signs, but you'll never see them when your eyes are on yourself. If you lift your eyes up, you can consider his joy and find it, even in the hustle and bustle of Christmas. I saw it this week. I went to the Jingle Jam Express in the mall. And there was a ton of kids in there. There were kids that a mom had dropped off and she was in full Muslim guard. She's like, I'm gonna trust these Christians with my kids. We had them all playing Lincoln Brewster style guitars. We showed them this video of other kids that explained in a super clear, non-condemning way the gospel of Jesus Christ. These kids loved it so much when the moms come to get them, they beg them and say, don't take us back out into the mall. (laughs) Hey, I see Jesus in that moment. Do you know where else I saw Jesus? I went to our gift wrapping station. Just a simple thing. You'd think this is just maybe not spiritual. It's just a nice little service. The gal that runs it for us, her name's Karen. She's awesome, Baysider. I went there at 9 p.m. this week. And I'm sitting there at the gift wrapping station. I'm talking to Karen. She's so tired, her, her words are literally slurred. I said, what'd you do today? She said, I wrapped hundreds and hundreds of gifts. She said, I wrapped a gift for one lady who said, I'm buying this for my ex-husband. He needs it. She wrapped a gift for a guy who said, I want you to make sure you don't lose this. I'm putting diamond earrings inside the coffee maker that I'm giving my wife. I hope I didn't ruin that for someone else. I mean, the toaster. Okay, we have to close this service, people. Come on. Here's the cool one. After all the wrapping had ended, after all the wrapping had ended, a little gal from one of the shops came, and after everyone had left the mall, she came and she said, hey, 
you guys are a church, right? She said, yes. She said, um, my life is kind of going bad right now. Would you pray for me? And Karen took her hands that were all kind of cut up from wrapping paper and grabbed this little girl's hands and right there they prayed together. Karen can see where Jesus is. Can you and I?